Hey, my name is Tanner Britt. I serve on the worship team at Valley Life Church Arrowhead. And at Valley Life, we want to be known as a church that prays. So we're going to take a few minutes to pray together. If you would, just gather up together in your homes as we walk through these prompts. Let's spend time today praying for other churches across the country. Ask God to give wisdom to leaders and churches in America as they deal with disease and anger in their communities. Pray that like-minded churches to Valley Life would seek first the kingdom of God and in so doing minister to their local communities. Pray for our Valley Life churches to stay on mission and work in each of our communities to shine the light of the gospel in the midst of darkness. Today, our scripture reading is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. And though we're in this difficult time, we thank you that we still have ways that we can minister to those around us, that we can stir each other up to good works. God, we pray that our churches and churches like ours would not lose their mission, but would instead continue to shed the gospel in the darkness of our world. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Mike Lee, and I get to be the pastor here at Valley Life North Mountain. I'm so glad that you're joining us this morning. So whether you're watching on our website or watching on Facebook, I'm really excited to connect with you. And if you're watching on Facebook, I would love for you to just let us know that you're here by commenting, say hello or good morning in the comment section. And if you're watching on our online platform, please just type in hello or good morning in the chat so that we can know that you're here. Now, if you're sitting there wondering, does Mike really want me to do that? Like, is that something he's just saying or does he really want me to do that? The answer is yes, I really do want you to do that. I really do want you to type in there and let us know that you're here. So I would tell you that right now at my house, I mean, not right now, right now, because right now, right now, I'm up here preaching at our at our mama church up in Tremonta. But right now in like real life, when you're watching on Sunday morning, what's happening in my own house is that me and Penny and our kids, James, Michaela and Courtney are all on a device and they have the sermon up on their device as we have the sermon on our TV. And they're doing that so that they can type in the chat. Courtney likes to interact with some of you during the chat and she loves to hear if Andy Page has a joke for the day. And so they're all doing that. And I would encourage you to do that as well. This is a great way that we can participate in this season when we are in church online. And I'll also have Facebook up on my phone and church online on my laptop. And that way I can be in both places at once. I've always wanted to be able to be in two places at once. And this season has allowed me to do that. Isn't it fantastic? Now, If you've noticed, whenever I welcome everyone in the morning, I'll often say, I get to be the pastor of this church. My son teases me every week about this. He says, Dad, you always say that, that you get to be the pastor of the church. And I want you to know that I say that very intentionally. You see, I love this church and I consider it a complete privilege to be the pastor here. Not only would I be willing to do this job for free, I would probably even be willing to pay for the opportunity to pastor this church. 
but don't tell anybody on the finance council that because they might ask me to start paying for it. You see, I love this church. I love the people who are part of this church. I love the staff that help to lead this church. I love our community groups and I love our service teams and I super love our worship ministry, youth ministry and kids ministry. Honestly, I gotta tell you, I get on every single Sunday morning at 9.30 just to hang out with those kids and I get on every single Sunday night at five o'clock just to see what's going on with youth. But mostly what I love is who we are as a church. I love who we are as a church. You see, we are a church that makes a big deal out of Jesus. We will talk about and worship Jesus every single time we get together. Whether we're preaching through Hebrews or Romans or Acts or Deuteronomy, we are going to get to talk about and praise Jesus Christ. We are a church that loves people inside of the church and outside of the church really, really well. We are a church where you will be known and loved. We are a church that sits under the authority of God in his holy word, empowered by his Holy Spirit, bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ on mission to make disciples and plant churches. We are a church that will make less of anything and everything else to make much of Jesus. But more than anything else, we are a people and a church who have been shaped by what Jesus has done for us. We are a people and a church who have been shaped by what Jesus has done for us. Now we've spent the last several chapters of the book of Hebrews unpacking this idea that Jesus is better. He is better of so many things. He is the better thing of which we are convinced. He is better than the priests, better than the temple, better than any sacrifice, better than anything else. And because of all of this, we can be unwavering. Because of all the things that Jesus is, we can be unwavering. We actually called this series Unwavering Inside and Out because we can be unwavering in our faith in Jesus Christ. We can be unwavering in our confidence of his sacrifice. We can be completely unwavering in our knowledge that Jesus is enough. And we can be unwavering in the mission he gave us to share the gospel with the world. Now, to be sure, there is much wavering going on in the world today. Much that people will be tempted to argue about or pick a side on. Much wavering to be had, such as who should we elect as president? What should we do about school this year? Should kids go in person or online? When should churches begin to meet again? Is this mega pastor or that mega pastor handling the whole situation right? What should we do if players kneel or if they don't kneel? And there are places where that wavering and the arguing for people to waver on those topics exists. You see, I see it too. It happens on Facebook and on Twitter and on the media and in groups. Some people have dubbed these arguments the culture wars. There's like a, a culture war that's raging. And man, those wars are raging right now. I have seen people that I truly believe love and care about each other say hurtful and nasty things to each other on social media about these issues and others. I have seen people who have been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ say things on social media that are just, they're just awful. You see, I live in this world too, and I know that we care about those things. I know that you care about those things. I know that you have opinions on those things, and I am not asking you to not care about those things. See, I'm not asking you to just stop caring about all those things. Maybe they're very, very important to you. I'm not asking you to stop caring about those things, but I am asking you. As your pastor, I am asking you, almost begging you. I am begging you to care less about all of those things. Care less about all of those things than Jesus Christ, his church, and his mission. Yes, care about America and the issues that America is facing. Yes, care about the things that matter to you. Yes, care about those things, but care so much more about Jesus Christ, his church, and his mission. 
Let us be a people who have the ability to waver on preferential things, but be unwavering on Jesus Christ, his church, and his mission. Last week we said that we can rest, we can rest in the unwavering sacrifice of Jesus, that we can know that Jesus' perfect life, his horrific death, and his resurrection was enough to save anyone who could believe in him. And this week in our text, we get to see what the application of that sacrifice is to our lives. We get to see what kind of people and what kind of church we can be because of the sacrifice of Jesus. See, the thing that I want as the pastor of this church for you and for me and for my family and for our church is for our lives to reflect what Jesus has done for us. The, the big idea of this sermon, the thing that I am trying to get to is this. I want us, and I would therefore say, let us be a people and a church whose lives reflect what Jesus has done for us. Let us be a people and a church whose lives reflect what Jesus has done for us. Now, I know that that statement seems like a big idea, kind of a statement, and it needs to be broken down. I actually ran it past a friend of mine, and he said, I don't know, it sounds kind of corporate speaky. You're going to have to break that down, and we're going to use our text today to break that down. We're going to use that text to break it down. I, I also want you to know that I am not speaking to the entire world. You see, mostly because I don't think the entire world cares much what a small church planner like me has to say. But I am speaking to this body of believers called Valley Life North Mountain. I am calling us to be a people and a church whose lives reflect what Jesus has done for us. And so with that, let's get into the text. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, we're going to start in just uh, verse 19, verse 19 through 21. It says, Therefore, brothers... Since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through the flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God. He starts this section with a therefore statement. And if you are a, a teacher, if you teach English, don't get mad. Uh, McKenna Skaggs, if you're watching, I know you're getting ready to teach English this year. We're praying for you so hard and for you and for your students. Don't get mad that, that the author here starts with therefore. What he's saying is that I am referencing all of this stuff that I spent the last several weeks going over, particularly Jesus' sacrifice. Therefore, since we have confidence to enter the holy places, this means that we have that confidence. Re remember, like a, a couple of weeks ago, I said that Jesus did not die to take us into the temple once per year. Jesus died to take us into heaven for eternity. So we are a people confident of that. A people confident that because and through the blood of Jesus, we can enter the holiest places. A people confident that our Jesus is our great high priest who is not just better than any other high priest. He is a perfect great high priest. Because of all of that, we ought to be a certain kind of people and a certain kind of church. This should influence us. Like if we truly believe that Jesus lived a perfect life, died a horrific death, and resurrected, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father, and if we believe Jesus did that, to save everyone who would believe in him, if we truly believe that, then our lives must reflect it. If we truly believe that, then our lives must, must reflect that. And then the author of Hebrews is going to launch into five exhortations. Now you may remember that an exhortation is more than just encouragement. It is emphatic encouragement. It is excited, emphatic encouragement. And I wish I could find that kind of enthusiasm as I'm preaching this to you today. He gives five emphatic encouragements in verses 22 through 25 that say, if you believe in Jesus, then you should. If, then you should. Now I wanna be crystal clear. I wanna be super clear because people will misinterpret this and I don't want you to misinterpret this. I wanna be crystal clear on what the author is not saying. The author is not saying if you do these five things, then Jesus will save you. He's not saying if you do these five things, Jesus will love you more. He's not saying if you do these five things, you will never have trouble and life will be all sunshine and gumdrops. No, he is 
saying, because of what Jesus has done, let us, himself included, be a certain kind of people and a certain kind of church. So you're going to hear five let us exhortations today. And I challenge you. I'm literally challenging you. My friend Jordan Swayze said he always likes it when I challenge you. So I challenge you to write these five things down. There's just going to be five things. And I challenge you to write them down. Write them down in your notes. Write them down on your phone. Write them down and, and, and be able to put them somewhere. Seriously, write these down and then hang them up somewhere this week where you will see them every day. As a matter of fact, if you accept this challenge, write these five things down and take a picture of it and send it to me. I would love to see it and know that we are in this together. And the first thing is this, this first exhortation is this, let us draw near to God. Let us draw near to God. Hebrews 10, says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And to whom are we to draw close? Well, to God. We get to draw near to God. And as a Christian, I am afraid that sometimes we take this for granted. You see, because of Jesus' perfect sacrifice, we can draw close to God. We can draw near to God. See, sin separated us from God. It was a serious problem. We get an awful picture of what that looked like with our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. We see that in the very, very beginning, God was walking with them and he was talking with them. And they were together in the garden and it was awesome. But then they chose to sin and God literally had to separate from them, literally had to throw them out of the garden. Genesis 3, 23 through 24 says here, says uh, Genesis 3, 23 through 24, therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Adam and Eve were completely separated from God, like removed from God's presence. And you and I know what that feels like. You see, we might not remember it, but you and I know what that feels like because before you believed in Jesus, you were in that same separated state. I, I lived almost 18 years of my life like that. I've shared my story with you many a times, but I would tell you again that I spent the vast majority of my childhood and my teenage years believing with every single bit of my being that there was a God, but also believing that I had absolutely no access to him. And then Jesus saved me. And because of that, I can draw near to a perfect God like a little kid who has been hurt and scared by the brokenness of this world, I can run to God and jump into his arms. Like young teenagers who have been heartbroken by the harshness of the world, we can run to God and draw near to him. And we can do this because of what Jesus did. And because of what Jesus did, I don't want to let anything get in the way of me drawing close to him. I have to be honest. I got to be just totally honest with you. I am just as frustrated with the way COVID-19 is impacting everything in my life right now. But it is not going to get in the way of me drawing close to God. Now, I may not be able to hang out with some people that I desperately want to hang out with. I may not be able to eat in some restaurants that I would love to eat in. But the only thing that could get in my way of drawing near to God is me. You see, because of Jesus, you can draw near to God whenever you want to. James 4.8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. This is a promise from scripture. So you don't need anything that this broken world has to offer in order to draw near to God. Just draw near to him and he will draw near to you. What does that look like? Well, it looks like reading his word. It looks like talking to him. It looks like admiring his beautiful creation. And you can do this and not let anything get in the way of that. And I know some of you will say, yeah, but it's, it's hard. Some of you say, well, I'm having a hard time right now getting close to God because I can't get together at my church or I can't worship well. I just can't focus at home. And I will give you 
that our current circumstances might make it more challenging to draw close to God, but he is worth the effort. And if you can remember what it was like to be separated from him, then you ought not let anything get in the way of you drawing close to him now. Let us be a people and a church that draw close to God. Number two is this. Number two is this. Let us hold unwavering to hope. Let us hold unwavering to hope. Let us hold on to it. Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus, we can have unwavering hope in Jesus. And the cultural wars will tell you to place your hope in something else. And I'm telling you that there is nothing else in all the world that can hold the weight of your hope but Jesus. I'm not going to put my hope in Donald Trump or Joe Biden or Kanye West come November. I'm not going to do that. I mean, I'm going to go and I'm going to vote for somebody. I'm going to vote for one of them and then submit to their authority as long as it doesn't cause me to disobey scripture. But my king is coming. My king is coming. I serve and worship the Lion of Judah. I am not motivated by either the donkey or the elephant. My king is the Lion of Judah who will come back and make everything right. And I am not going to put my hope in J.D. Greer, John MacArthur, Francis Chan, David Platt, Bob Goff, or even Brian Bowman any more than I would want you to put your faith in me. Though I respect and learn from all of them, I am going to put my hope in the great high priest, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again to save me. See, I may be willing to hope for other things but I'm not gonna put my hope in other things. See, I'm not gonna put my hope in my ability to convince anyone to stand or kneel for the flag or my ability to sway anyone to send their kids to school or to keep them at home. I'm not gonna put my hope in anything but Jesus. As the hymn goes, my hope is built on nothing less, nothing less than Jesus Christ, my righteousness, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Man, don't you be singing that song. Don't you be singing that song if your hope is on a bunch of other stuff. You see, I may be willing to hope for things. I may be willing to hope for things. I I have things that I hope for. I hope that they find a vaccine. I hope that none of you get sick. I hope that my son can play football his senior year. I hope that I get to watch Courtney dance on stage soon and watch Michaela compete in basketball. I hope the school districts let us in the building soon and when they do that none of us get sick. I hope for all those things, but none of those things can hold my unwavering hope. There are no guarantees on any of those things. All of them are just sweet frames that I dare not trust. Our hope is in Jesus and nothing else. Let us be a church and a people who hold unwavering hope to Jesus. Number three is this. Let us stir one another up to love and good works. Let us stir one another up to love and good works. Hebrews 10, 24 says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, we ought to be a people who stir others up to love and good works. Man, we live in a world where it is socially acceptable to stir each other up in an effort to beat each other down. We really do. We live in a world where people will say, if you vote for this person or that person, you can't be my friend anymore. We live in that kind of a world. We engage in cultural wars on social media to win some battles while we refuse to engage with the people in our own homes, our own churches, and our own neighborhoods. See, because of Jesus, we don't have to win some morality battle that we have no business in in the first place. We can simply spur each other on to loving good deeds. And you say, well, what does that look like? What does it look like to do that? Well, let me just give you a couple of examples. 
I have a good friend, his name is Rob Smith, and a couple of years ago, Penny and I were at our house, and we were hanging out with Rob and his wife, Brenna, and they were just over there and hanging out with the kids, and right around the time that dinner started, Penny and I disagreed about something, and I spoke in a manner to her that was unloving. I, I don't even really remember what I said, but I do remember that I could tell that I had said something that hurt her feelings. And then after dinner, Penny and Brenna were doing the dishes, and Rob and I were sitting outside, kind of watching the kids, and he leaned over and he said, hey man, he said, hey, man, I, I love you. And he goes, I, I love you and I value our friendship, but I got to tell you something. Just a little while ago, just a little while ago, right before dinner, you were, you were harsh to your wife. You were, you were unloving. And I, and I know you love her, but, man, you were so unloving. And, and, and I really do think you owe her an apology. And I got to tell you, at first I was a little bit offended. I mean, who did he think he was to tell me? I mean, I was like, what, what are you doing here, Rob? But he was my brother in Christ, and he was right. I had spoken unlovingly, and I did owe Penny an apology. Rob stirred me to the right thing. Rob stirred me that night to love and good deeds, and he still does that. He calls and encourages me all the time. In our church, it could look like that, but it could also look like calling someone who has been missing community groups and saying, hey, you've been missing community group. Is everything okay? Can I help you with anything? It could look like saying, hey, are you, are you okay? Is everything going well with you? I just haven't talked to you in a while. I just wanted to check in. It could look like just being an encouragement and saying, hey, you're doing a really good job. Like if you were to reach out to Ashley and say, hey, you're doing a really, really good job of leading kids ministry right now, and we're so thankful for you. Or if you were to reach out to Justine and say, hey, you are doing a really, really good job of leading worship, and I am so thankful for you. Or to say to one of the young people in our church, hey, I am really glad that you are here. It is exciting to have your energy and your perspective in our church. Or if you were to reach out to the, one of the more seasoned people in our church and say, I am so thankful that you are here sharing your wisdom and experience with this church. Those things are uplifting. Those things stir us on to love and good deeds. It could look like parents. It could look like parents saying to their kids, you are doing a really good job and I am proud of you. So consider this, consider this, at least for the week, consider this. When you come across a comment on Facebook or a tweet or a picture on Instagram and you think about replying, ask yourself, am I spurring others on to, to loving good deeds with this? Heck, before you post anything yourself this week, ask yourself, am I spurring others on in love and good deeds? I would question how missional any of us could be at reaching people for Jesus while we engage in social media arguments. See, in a world that seems bent on debating with each other, people who believe in the sacrifice of Jesus, who would stir each other on to love and good deeds, would bring light into a dark world. Let us at least be a church and a people who, who stir others on to love and good deeds. Number four is this. Let us not give up meeting. Let us not give up meeting. Hebrews 10, 25a says, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. See, because of Jesus' sacrifice, let's not give up meeting together as is the habit of some. The author says, please don't give up meeting together. There is purpose in our meeting. It is the place where we are most able to stir each other up, as we will see in a moment, and encourage each other. Let us not neglect to meet together as is the habit of some, period. That is the infallible word of God. And now, as the pastor of this church, I would tell you that on Sunday mornings, for right now, this is where we can meet together. You see, the truth of the matter is that we rent a space from a school district that is desperately trying to figure out how to reopen its doors to students and churches like us. And so for a season, we've had to meet online. And you can know that I and the staff are praying about and looking for other places that we could meet. You can know that many people in this church are continuing to give to the Press On campaign in an effort to make the money, to, to save up the money to potentially buy a building. But right now, this is where we meet on Sunday and I want you to be here. I want you to be here and to be present. And I know it can be challenging, but because of the sacrifice of Jesus, I believe it can be done. I want you to be here. 
I want you gathered up on Sundays at 9.30 for kids online and 10 o'clock for our service. And I know that you could watch this sermon on YouTube or listen to the podcast later in the week, but it would not be the same as gathering up. I want you to gather up. I want you to be here and to participate in that chat online and in the comments section on Facebook. I want you to come to our Zoom lobby after service today. I want you to attend community groups. I want you to continue to meet and be present. You see, there is a way to come to a physical church building and not be present. And there is a way to come to a church building and be completely present. And in the very same way, there is a way to attend a church service online and not be present. You could be doing something else. The sermon could just be on your TV as background noise. You could be surfing the internet or shopping or whatever else. But there is a way to come and be completely present. There is a way to come and be just as engaged from your device as you would be if you were in person. I want you to be present and I want you to be known here. I want you to be known in this church, and we can't know you if we don't see that you're here. You see, we actually had someone come to our church back when we could still meet in the cafeteria, and afterwards she said, I don't know if this church is for me because I want to be anonymous. I just want to hang out in the back and be anonymous. And I said, oh yeah, this is probably not that kind of church at all. You're right, you can't be anonymous here. We care too much about people for you to be anonymous here. And some of you might say, but yeah, did you really mean that? And I would be like, yes, totally. I totally meant that. See, there are lots of churches that you can go and attend and be anonymous, but this isn't one of those churches. This is a church to be known in, a church that will miss you when you're not here, a church that cares about you and shows up for you when you need help. And of course, Sunday morning isn't the only time to meet. We meet in community groups and we meet in service teams and our building is closed, but nothing else is. There's nothing stopping anyone in this church from meeting together to spur each other on to love and good deeds. Now, I'll admit that meeting online is not my preference, but I already said at the beginning of this message that I will care much less about my preferences and much more about Jesus his church, and his mission. Let us be a church and a people who continue to meet together. And finally, number five is this. Let us encourage one another. Let us encourage one another. Hebrews eleven twenty five 25 ends with this. It says, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. You see, because of the sacrifice of Jesus, we can encourage one another. We can be people who encourage each other. I would wonder how many of you realize how encouraging you are to be around. Like if you've ever walked into the building at the church and seen Matt Johnson at the sound booth and just walked up and got a hug from him. I know you've done it because it's so encouraging. Or have you ever stopped to talk to grandma and asked her how she's doing and she says something cute and adorable like better than I deserve or any day I wake up is a great day and it is so encouraging. Or have you ever been greeted by Andy Page or Courtney with a smile on their face and you smiled back yourself because it was encouraging. Or have you ever gotten a masterpiece from Sadie Wagner or taken just a moment to watch Easton Humphreys sing loud and smile? Because of course you have. It is so encouraging. Let us be an encouraging church. I want you to say hello and interact in that chat because it is encouraging to others. It's encouraging to know that we're in this together. I want people to see your name in that chat. If you are watching at home with multiple people, get on multiple devices and participate. It is encouraging when names of people we love and care about come up in the chat and in the comment section on Facebook and we know that they're gathered up with us. Let us be the kind of church where when you're not okay, you can come and be encouraged. And let us be the kind of church where when you are okay, you can come and encourage someone else. And of course, let's be that church on Sunday morning, but let's also be that church during the week. When's the last time you called someone or texted them in the middle of the week to just say, hey, I'm thinking of you? When's the last time you saw someone struggles and said, hey, I see you and I am for you. How can I help? 
See, because of Jesus' sacrifice, we can be an encouraging church and an encouraging people, even if we have different opinions. I want us to be the kind of church that, who find out things about people that are different and we still love on them. For example, I want to be the kind of church where when somebody finds out that one set of parents is sending their kids back to school and another set of parents is going to keep their kids online, that our response to both is the same. That we would say to them, hey, I bet that was a really hard decision and I bet you made the absolute best decision for your kids. How can I help you? I want us to be that kind of church where we could disagree on preferential things, but be so locked in on our agreeance of Jesus Christ his church, and his mission, that nothing else we disagree in would get in the way of that? What if we engaged in far less debate and participated in far more encouragement? Let us be a church and a people that encourage others. So I think what this whole thing comes down to, I think what all of this comes down to, what I really want all of us to do in this season and until Jesus comes back is to prioritize Jesus, his church, and his mission. And I know that there are other things that you care about and are important to you. I know that you care about elections. I know that you care about masks. I know that you care about school openings and COVID-19. I know that you care about kneeling or standing. I know that you care about the fate of America. And of course, you should care about those things. But as your pastor, as your pastor, and because of the sacrifice of Jesus, I am exhorting you to prioritize Jesus, his church, and his mission. I exhort you to prioritize Jesus. I want you to believe in his life, death, and resurrection. I want Jesus to be the most important relationship in your life. I want you to rest your unwavering hope on Jesus. I want you to make much less of anything else in the world and much more of Jesus. And as your pastor, I exhort you to prioritize the local church. Last weekend, my family, went, my family and I, Penny and the kids, and I went on a trip to Tonto Natural Bridge. We were told that it was open, and we got up there, and it was closed. This isn't actually my picture. I don't even know that guy. He seems pretty cool, but he wasn't there when I was there. Anyways, we got up to this place where Tonto Natural Bridge was, and, and they told us that we could go into the park, but all the trails were closed. And it was pretty fantastic because we stood in this spot where that guy is. It's up on your screen right now. You see this? And we saw the picture of this amazing bridge. It looks really cool. It's like a natural formed bridge. And if it wasn't closed, we could have walked down inside of it. We could have got down. There's like a creek down there. We could have got in the water. We could have looked around. We could have we did a lot of cool stuff, but it was closed. So what we caught was a glimpse. We caught a glimpse of it, but we weren't able to participate in all of it. And I don't want you to just have a glimpse of this church. I don't want you to have a glimpse of this church. I don't want you to see a part of this church. I want you to prioritize the local church. And if this is not the church that you feel like you could be all in with, then talk to me. I would love to help you find a place where you can do that. I want you to be all in. I would encourage you today to take a next step. I would encourage you today to take a next step. There are several next steps. We talk about this every week that everyone at Valley Life has a next step to take. The first is to just be a believer. We would encourage you to believe in Jesus Christ. And if you have believed in Jesus, I would encourage you to be baptized. And if you'd like to do that, I would love to talk to you about that today. I would encourage you to be a giver, to trust this church with your money. I have said many times that if you can't trust a church with your money, why would you trust them with more precious things than that? I would encourage you to be a giver and I would love to talk to you or the staff would love to talk to you about how to get started with that. I would encourage you to take the step to become a server, to join a service team and help us reach the community for Jesus. I would encourage you to do that today. I would encourage you to become a learner, and that is to join a community group where you can be known and loved and cared for, and where you can love and care for others. You don't even have to live in Phoenix to do that. We have people that are part of our community groups right now that don't even live in Arizona. And so if that is you, join today. Become a member of our community groups. And finally, I would invite you to, if you've done all those things, to become a member. You see, if you've done all those things, you should be a member here, and I would encourage you to do that. But above all of that, above all of that, 
What I mostly would exhort you to do today, what I would most exhort you to do today is to prioritize Jesus's mission. Jesus gave the most straightforward mission statement of all times in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 through 20, when he said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So you can't make a disciple of someone you don't know, and you sure can't get to know someone well by arguing with or fighting with them on social media. We are called to love our neighbors, and Jesus said that those neighbors are everyone. So who are you praying for? Who are you sharing the gospel with? Who are you discipling? See, there is nothing stopping you from doing that stuff. If you would like help with that, we would love to help you. We actually have a discipleship guide that you could use to take a friend through. And if you'd like that, you can text guide to the number on the bottom of the screen or type guide in the chat and we will get you a copy of that discipleship guide. Remember, you don't have to do anything for Jesus to live a perfect life, die a horrific death and defeat that death to save you. Jesus already did all of that. But because he did that, if you believe that he did that, our lives should reflect it. So how will your life reflect that this week? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I thank you so much for your sacrifice. And this week, Lord, I thank you for a text that exhorts us, that strongly encourages us to live a life that reflects what you've done. Lord, help us to do that well this week, that you may be glorified through us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So at the end of every, uh, at the end of every service, I always like to give a, a basic invitation. I want to invite you to respond. Whenever the gospel is preached, there is an opportunity to respond, and I would invite you to respond. And the first response is this, I would invite you to, to believe. I would invite you to believe today, to become a Christian. To, to pray. You could pray right now. If you want to become a Christian right now, if you want Jesus to save you right now, you could pray. You could pray and believe to say, Jesus, I am a sinner and I am sorry. I need you to save me because I cannot save myself. I believe in your life, death, and resurrection. And I would tell you that if you can pray that prayer and believe that prayer, Jesus will save you. The other invitation is to come to the table. I would invite you to come to the table to take the bread, which represents Jesus's body, and dip it in the juice, represents Jesus's blood, spilled for the forgiveness of sins. And I would invite you to take that in proclamation of the fact that your hope is in Jesus. I would invite you to give, to, to join this church on the mission to make disciples and plant churches. And I would invite you today to take a next step a great first step would be to join us in the Zoom meeting lobby right after our closing announcements. I would love to see you and see your face today. So let's join Justine and worship Jesus, and then I will see you in the Zoom lobby. I love you, church. See you soon. is calling Have you come to the end of yourself Do you thirst for a drink from the well Jesus is calling Oh come to the altar The Father's arms are and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus
Thank you. 
What a beautiful day 